So thank you everyone for joining. This is our inaugural area focus webinar. Um, today we'll be featuring the finance uh, area. Uh, so my name is Greg Rombo. I'm our manager of undergraduate programs at the Degree School of Business. Uh, we've decided to put together these sessions um, for our in-course students who are moving into their upper years and beginning to select their electives and decide whether or not to do minors and professional designations. Uh, so we thought this was a uh, timely information for you. Um, for students that are applying to McMaster, uh, we have several on the call as well. Um, just uh, to reiterate that McMaster um, studying with the Group School of Business ends in your Honors Bachelor of Commerce degree. Uh, so it's a general degree, um, but along the way you have the opportunity to specialize in an area. Uh, it's not a formal major, um, but it's something that we call our areas of focus. Um, so you have a great deal of electives um, beginning in your second year, um, but primarily focus in your third and fourth year. Um, where you have the opportunity to select courses from specific areas across the university, um, as well as within the School of Business. So we wanted to present you with some of our uh, opportunities um, for you to study within the finance area. So what is it? Um, what, where does it lead? What other certifications and designations can you uh, pursue while you're completing your degree? So it's a great opportunity to, to kill two birds with one stone. Um, so I have a number of speakers here today with me. I'm joined by five of our faculty, um, as well as one of our one current student who is the president of our Degree Finance Association. Uh, we will start today uh, with William Huggins. Uh, he is going to share an engaging pocket history and evolution of the finance field. Um, so William is a lecturer at the Degree School of Business, teaching courses in finance, economics, and statistics in both our undergrad and specialized grad programs. Uh, next, we'll hear from Dr. Okwara Maud. Um, so you'll be very familiar with him going into second and third year, uh, who will be discussing our level two finance classes and what to expect uh, next year, possibly. Uh, so Dr. Ahmed's teaching interests include corporate and managerial finance, mergers and acquisitions, as well as corporate governance. Uh, then we will hear from Dr. Sherman Chung about the CFA designation and the CFA scholarship. So make sure you're taking notes. Um, Dr. Chung specializes in investments in financial markets. Uh, then we'll hear from Sumit Bose, uh, one of our sessional instructors, uh, about uh, managing personal finances, as well as financial planning and the uh, CFP certification. Um, then we will hear from our DFA president, Marco Martino Coons. So he's our current student in his fourth year. Um, and he is the president of the Degree Finance and Investment Council. Uh, the McMaster chapter of the C and CEO of the Investa Insights and the co-founder of the Mac AI Ventures. And he's just returning from an internship uh, with National Bank and the CIBC. Uh, and then finally, we have our area chair, Dr. Trevor Chamberlain, uh, who will be covering a lot of the, uh, anything that we've missed along the way, um, but speaking just to the area and how we're coordinating across the area in general. Um, so please, uh, Feel free to put some questions into the chat as we go through. Uh, we will save time at the end um, to answer any questions that you might have or to post the follow-up um, answers to any questions that we can't get to in the session, we will share uh, via Discord. Okay, so uh, this webinar is going to be recorded. So you do have it for your record or you can recommend that to uh, your friend to watch as well. Uh, but we will start first with um, Will Huggins. Hey, good morning, everybody. I, uh... I want to get started off with a little bit of background on uh, finance itself, because for the most part, people tend to think about finance as being something uh, relatively modern. They tend to think of it as being something uh, relatively sophisticated. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that things started off in a really simple way. Um, the earliest evidence we have of finance finance in human history uh, actually goes back to the beginning of writing at the early stages of the Bronze Age. Uh, so when people get around to inventing cuneiform around 5,000 years ago, one of the interesting things is that 90% of those clay documents we've found uh, spread all across the Middle East, those are financial records. It gives you a real good sense of how long these kinds of tools have been with us and why exactly we invented them. Uh, in fact, some archaeologists even think that humans got around to inventing writing specifically because it was going to simplify accounting, finance, and control of large-scale coordination projects. It allowed us to do things like irrigate vast areas of land, to build whole cities, and a variety of other kinds of large-scale projects. The first evidence we have of humans using debt as a financial tool dates back to this same sort of Sumerian period in the Bronze Age. 
uh, and so does the first evidence of debt forgiveness, what the Sumerians called an amargi. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, uh, some of this archaeology has made its way into the meme sphere of the internet. You may have encountered A. Nazir and his uh, high quality copper ingots, uh, which seem to have made its way onto t-shirts and memes all over the place. Uh, this also dates from that early Bronze Age period. And the reason this story is interesting is because it points to the fact that we had, to some extent, large scale businesses with silent partners involved. In one instance, A. Nazir actually raised capital from 50 different investors so that he could travel to the city of Dilmun in order to trade herb baskets for pearls. It seems relatively simple until you realize that that's the foundations of modern corporations. Now, another interesting thing that emerges during this time, of course, is interest on loans. And most interest on loans ultimately comes out of the agricultural nature of what people were borrowing. If I borrow 100 cows from you for a year, who owns the children? If I borrow a whole pile of seed from a granary, who gets to the um, surplus that is generated by planting this grain? Uh, and so this is where the concept of interest ultimately comes from. The Sumerian word for interest is mash, which is the same word they use for baby cow. Wow. So it goes to show you exactly how long we've had finance with us. Uh, but things have changed a lot over the years, right? Whereas originally we were dealing with trying to irrigate and build up Sumerian city-states, Inevitably, things got more complicated, and we begin to see a sort of pushback from society uh, to, against the pure economic optimization that people started to engage in, right? There were issues about how much interest could be charged reasonably without offending um, the general population, for instance, and we see things like limits on interest rates appearing as far back as things like Hammurabi's code 38 centuries ago. Now, of course, things have changed a lot since the Bronze Age. One of the big evolutionary steps in finance happened around uh, the 1600s when we start to see public stock exchanges and large scale public corporations like the Dutch East India Company. They had managed to attract 10,000 investors in the first six months that they were public. And so this required significant improvements in the way that companies reported to their investors uh, about the kinds of risks that they were exposed to, about the value of their shares that they were buying, et cetera. And this turned out to be an important necessary step towards industrialization so that we could finance big things like canals and railroads, factories, pipelines that stretch across continents. That's simply too much for any individual entrepreneur to finance. And so we had to develop systems that enabled people to collaborate together. And that's really what our financial plumbing is all about. Now, of course, in the 20th century, things got even more sophisticated. We introduced ideas of scientific management that first appear in operations uh, sciences. And then we also added in computers to it, which enabled us to do all of the math of finance in a much more reasonable fashion. And so this has led us to sort of the modern world of finance now that relies very heavily on computers and mathematical sophistication in order to properly allocate the resources uh, that we've been doing basically since the beginning of the Bronze Age. Now, one of the things that comes up when people think about finance is, what kind of job can I get in finance? And most people typically think about stockbrokers or about lenders at commercial banks, but there's a lot of different opportunities uh, within this space. In fact, there's far too many for me to actually enumerate in the five, six minutes that I have. Uh, if I were to spend you know, just the amount of time necessary to list them off, I'd run out of time about halfway down my list. But I picked out a few here that I thought were particularly important uh, as opportunities for people to pursue. Some are reasonable for in, uh, introductory level graduates out of undergrad programs. Others are more complex jobs you'll try to path towards over the first decade of your career. Uh, but some of these jobs include analysts and researchers who are trying to forecast the future, effectively what cash flows or what risks or what kinds of conditions businesses might be operating under in the future. There are advisors that are helping people how to allocate their personal capital. Sometimes these advisors are working on something like mergers and acquisitions. Other times they're trying to help advise pension plans about what kinds of infrastructure to invest in abroad. Sometimes they're simply trying to help people find the right kinds of mutual funds to build their retirement with. There's also institutional sales, uh, and that's really important. When we're looking at sales, we're talking about buying and selling sometimes whole companies. Sometimes we're talking about buying and selling specific kinds of insurance products that companies require. One of the things about sales is that it's really, really overlooked. Uh, because a lot of people would prefer to simply do some math far away from people. But if you're really hoping to make money in finance, it's worth developing the negotiating skills necessary to pursue a, a career in sales. That's where most of the money really is. There's also trading opportunities where companies are looking to exchange some of their securities that they hold in inventory throughout the day, trying to ride the waves of the market. 
There are portfolio managers who are allocating wealth for wealthy individuals and institutions uh, across long periods of time. There are risk managers that help firms to identify the different kinds of forces that might influence their cash flows in the future. Actuaries and underwriters that serve the insurance industry. Um, now, a lot of people tend to overlook insurance, but I would warn you that finance is a lot more than banks. Uh, the insurance companies have collectively got a couple of trillion dollars under management around the world, and you'd be remiss to ignore them in terms of pursuing opportunities. But we've also got loan officers and credit specialists working at banks, trying to help match the right kinds of products and the right amount of capital to corporate borrowers. And perhaps most important these days, we have compliance officers. There's been a really substantial increase in the amount of monitoring that's going on in various industries and compliance officers who can help companies stay on the right side of new regulations are really important. Now, of course, the next question is where to work. And in this case, a lot of people tend to be focused on generally the largest opportunities. Like most students could name say three or four, maybe five big banks, but they're really unable to name say small boutique investment banks or half a dozen insurance companies or even half a dozen pension plans for that matter, all of which can offer them positions in the future. So I wanna quickly highlight for you a couple of places where opportunities lie. There's of course public sector opportunities with places like the Ministry of Finance at both provincial and federal levels, the Bank of Canada itself, the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, Export Development Canada, Canada Pension Plan, and of course, as you look around at the attendees today, uh, academia. Right? These are all very effective public sector jobs that allow you to use your financial skills to contribute to the benefit of society at large, instead of for, uh, for the private benefit of individuals or institutions. But the private sector also is very well developed. We've got commercial banks, investment banks, insurance companies, investment funds, pension plans, and frankly, just about any large firm that requires things like compliance or risk management. One of the things you may note is that Canada is particularly well developed in the financial sector. If we were to take a look at the market capitalization, a rough measure of how big companies are, and compare how much, in, how intense Canada is in finance compared to other countries around the world, we find that in terms of market cap, Canada has got twice as much invested in finance on a per capita basis as just about every other country out there. The world average runs about 18% of market cap. In Canada, as much as 35% of the TSX index is finance. So it's big business in Canada. There's over a million people working in finance in some way or another in this country. And that means we not only have very well-developed tools to use, we also have a lot of opportunities for people who want to pursue studies in this area. So what can you do to get the job? Well, the first thing I would recommend for you is to try to meet people. A lot of uh, students seem to think that you know, uh, networking involves going to a, somewhere, uh, a meeting in a suit, handing out uh, your resume, and then hoping to ask one clever question to the recruiter uh, before they run off to deal with someone else. The key thing I would point out is that it's a lot more than just meeting recruiters because the recruiter probably isn't the person deciding whether you get the job or not. So keep it in mind that you're going to need a whole legion of different people to be able to help you out. You're not only going to want to network with people who might be able to put in a good word at a company, but networking with things people like your professors can help you to secure good letters of recommendation for grad school, can help you secure letters of recommendation for employment, uh, and also don't neglect to the fact that you are networking with your fellow students while you're in class together. You might think that they can't get you a job, but you're only thinking about your first job, not thinking five, six, 10 years down the road when you've made a good impression on people at school, now they might be in a position to help you out. Don't forget to lay those kinds of long-term seeds because if you're a farmer, you might have your crop rise this year, but if you're planting a fruit orchard, it might take five to 10 years before those fruits are actually available. <clears throat> Next, Work on developing some professional certifications. Every employer out there knows that grade inflation over the last 50 years has been a real problem with universities all around the world. People have focused simply too much on grades as opposed to skills acquisitions, and so they tend to want to test people further. And this is what professional certifications really do. It's a verification that you know how to do the job, or at least have the skills necessary to do the job that isn't being granted by a university. So you can see it effectively as a second tent pole or a, a further certification that you actually know how to get things done. I'd encourage you to look at things like the CSC, the CFP, uh, and the CFA, most of which will be discussed later on in today's session. And finally, of course, don't neglect to do well in school. 
Um, I often try to advise people who are later in their career that grades aren't everything, but they are important, at least in terms of trying to get your first job. So don't neglect doing well in school. That's important uh, as part of your overall plan as well. As a final thing, just before I let you go, I want to point out that a lot of students, especially early in their careers, are very concerned about picking the right path, as though they have to make one choice when they're 18 years old that's going to determine the rest of their lives. This is totally not the truth. I've switched career path a few times myself, and I'd like to point out that what's more important is having flexibility to adapt to changing environments and changing opportunities. So rather than trying to focus specifically on a path towards what you imagine at 18 years old as a dream job, remember dreams change, a better thing to do would be to focus on having applicable skills that can take you in many directions. That way, if automation takes your job away in the next 10 years, at least you'll have some skills to adapt and stay relevant. <clears throat> Thanks very much, everybody. Hope this has been an interesting bit of introduction. There's a lot more to follow. Great, thank you so much, Will. That was interesting. I've learned a lot there. Um, so next we have uh, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, thank you, Will, for your uh, great introduction to the subject. I like Greg. I also learned a lot about the history of finance. Uh, so my, uh, my slide, I have just one slide just to introduce you guys to the couple of courses that you will have to take. Uh, when you're in the group, whether you're doing finance or not, I think you will have to see me anyway, a couple of times. Uh, so the first course that you will have in your uh, second year, first semester of your second year would be introduction to finance. Uh, now that we have moved into you know, online teaching, one advantage that I have found in here was to introduce Excel to the students immediately once they step into finance classes. So we are learning, as, as Will mentioned, uh, you will be getting skills uh, like at the very initiation of the course now, right? So that that puts a, that puts you guys at an advantage. Uh, so in this, uh, I don't want to go over the details, but we will introduce you guys to uh, things like shares and bonds and how to evaluate different projects so that you guys are honing your knowledge. You guys are getting to know about finance a little bit. Uh, so, and then towards the end, I will also talk about the risk and return relationship that you know, if you are taking, if you're willing to take more risk, you should be accepting to get higher returns as well. So I'll connect those dots uh, with you guys as well. And towards the end uh, of the course, I will re reiterate that we are in here. These two courses are in here to make you guys CFOs, chief finance officers, right? So you will be, you'd be expected to work as the top finance boss in any organization in a corporate form of business. So we are preparing you guys for that. In the second course that I have, it's called managerial finance. It's essentially, it gets you to be ready as a manager. And I remember uh, Marco taking my course, uh, uh, managerial finance course. So these are every week we do something which prepares you for each of the individual different kinds of jobs that a finance manager comes across on a given day. Uh, so we talk about dividend policies. We talk about mergers and acquisitions. We know we learn how to value a merger. We learn how to value not only projects, but also whole companies and parts of companies. Uh, in leasing, that's what we did last week in my class. So in leasing, you get to choose whether you should be buying an asset or whether you should be leasing an asset. And uh, the good thing about that is you can actually use that in your life as well. When you're thinking about, you know, after you graduate, hopefully, whether you should be buying a car or whether you should be leasing a car, you can make those decisions in uh, if you take this class, right? If you take my class. And then we also talk about risk management. It, uh, essentially, one of the big jobs of uh, finance manager is going to be uh, risk management, right? So although we, I don't think we will introduce uh, risk management certification here today, but that is also one avenue for finance students as well. Besides doing CFA, uh, CFP, we have FRM as well, right? Financial risk management. So my job is to make sure that I give you guys in the two courses, I give you guys enough skills so that you are ready, you are prepared to take up the next finance courses and essentially all the other certifications that you might be willing to pursue later. And the second job is not to, you know, get you guys frightened to not take finance later, to make sure that you guys are still interested in finance. You can see that it relates to your personal life, right? Even if you, if you do not become a finance manager, I want to make sure that you leave the classes with 
some knowledge which you would be able to use in your personal life as well. That's my objective when I'm teaching these two courses. And you guys will be seeing me. Uh, I don't think you have an option. If you are in big group, you will be seeing me. So uh, I want to reserve my time when you guys see me for 100 hours uh, in uh, next year or so. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you guys in class next year. Thank you so much, Bapar. <clears throat> yes, and you are unavoidable. I'll confirm that. Um, so next, uh, we have Dr. Chung, who's going to speak about the CFA uh, designation. Okay, uh, a lot you know about the CPA for accountant. Now in finance, we have a charter financial analyst, CFA. Now CFA is not for everyone. It's really for one segment of the finance profession. Uh, folks who go into investment banking, portfolio management and security analysis. Those are the area that CFA helps. Now the CFA is run by the CFA Institute in the US, but increasingly it's at international destinations. So people take CFA in Canada, in US, in Europe. So it's at international destinations, okay? Now, how can McMaster help you get these destinations? And this is where I come in. I am the so-called contact person here at McMaster. Now, what I do is quite simple. I look at the CFA curriculum and I get the list of requirement from the CFA Institute. And I check that against the courses the topics we cover in the finance course. And I want to make sure we cover enough of the CFA curriculum. In fact, we have to cover at least 70% of the curriculum to be accepted by the CFA to be admitted into the so-called university affiliation program. So I check that carefully. And in fact, we cover more than 70% of the curriculum. In particular, if you look at the five course and I single out those five courses. Now I recommend people to do more than five if you want more than 70%. Those five courses will satisfy at least 70% of the CFA curriculum. Now, if you can take more, and I recommend that, you actually get yourself ready for the CFA exam. You master what is required in the CFA curriculum. And that is the way it works, okay? Uh, basically, since this is finance area, I have to talk about money, I think. That is the fun part, the highlight of my day is to talk about money. Now let's talk about money. To take the CFA exams, now there are three exams all together. Level one, level two, level three. And it's quite expensive. If you think McMaster charge you a lot, well, you ain't seen nothing yet. CFA charge you a lot more just to enroll costs you $450, by the way. Now that $450 just basically get you into the game. And then each exam costs you another $1,000 US. And that is basically the way it works, okay? Oh, I think I'm in the wrong column. So it's $450, $1,000 each. Now, except that it's not the whole story. Level one, the failure rate is about 50%. Half of the students will not survive. So you try again, now that would be another thousand. So that add up quite a bit, okay? 
Now, what can we do for you? Actually, we can help. Since we are the CFA affiliation program, we get scholarship. Uh, we start with at least five. There's a complicated formula. We usually end up getting more. Uh, last year, we have about 10 scholarships to give away. Now, what would the scholarship do? Well, to begin with, they waive the $450 enrollment fee. So that is gone. And then the $1,000 registration fee is reduced to $350. So instead of paying $450 to get into the game, $1,000 to take the test, and chances are you may fail, it's reduced to $350. $150. So there's a savings of $1,100 US. So it's quite a significant savings. Now, except this scholarship are available to become students, MBA students, and MFIN students. So it's quite competitive. And the way we determine those scholarships is based on those courses. As you take more of those courses, the chances of getting it is better. And the better grades you have, the more likely you get the scholarship. And that is the way it's determined by the way. Now, if you want to find out more about the CFA, I provide the website there so you can check out what is required in addition to the three exam. You have you need 4,000 hours of experience. So it's structured very much like the CPA. And that is the nature of CFA exam. And of course, you can contact me about this later on. Okay. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer it. Or if not, then I'll basically pass it to the next speaker. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chung. Um, so our, our next speaker is going to speak to the Certified Financial Planner designation. Um, so Sumit Bose uh, teaches several of the courses um, that will help prepare you uh, in that pursuit. So I'll leave it to me. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone. And uh, my name is Shumit Bose. I teach several courses in the in the wealth management financial planning uh, stream. And uh, when we look at the uh, the what is personal financial management, a well, personal financial management is all about organizing your spending, financing and investment activities in order to reach your personal goals. And along this way, you're also implementing risk management strategies so as to protect yourself against uncontrollable events. And of course, personal finance and personal financial management uh, and personal financial planning is a journey. And along that journey, People can, in fact, live too long. Yes, you heard me right. People can actually live too long and they can outlive their capital. In fact, governments, Canadian governments, are very worried that people are, are accumulating too much debt, debt and not saving enough. And or, unfortunately, a person can die too soon or they can get disabled or get critically ill or suffer an injury. And this would affect their ability to earn an income and uh, pursue their various career goals, as well as impact their family. And so when we look at personal financial management, uh, we look at what I would call the personal financial management equation, which looks at from an individual level, we look at budgeting and cash flow uh, ma uh, management. Of course, uh, corporate finance looks at budgeting and cash flow management from the perspective of the corporation. Uh, but here we look at it from the perspective of the individual. And uh, just like cash is king for the corporation, cash is also king and liquidity for the individual. And proper budgeting is where it all starts. Then we look at credit management and debt management. Of course, just like in corporations, they have Fitch and Moody's and Standard & Poor that rates corporate debt. Of course, for personal individuals, we have TransUnion and Equifax that rate our own a credit rating and ability to service loans. Then of course we have investment management. And 
pension management, and we look at risk management and insurance, and also taxation looks at all the various areas and affects all these areas, because of course, it's not what you make, but what you legally keep from CRA, you are able to manage your affairs in a legitimate way and save money and taxes for your family. Then of course, there's business succession planning. A lot of wealth today is, 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 in, is, uh, is in small family businesses. And in the next few years, several trillion dollars worth of wealth is going to be tra transferred from uh, one generation uh, to the next. And so business succession planning is very important. Then there's retirement planning, looking at pensions and government pensions and employer pensions, and, and uh, how are, are people saving enough for uh, retirement. Then there's estate planning. Of course, people want to maximize this value of their estate and minimize taxes so that they can maximize the value of the estate that they leave to their uh, intended beneficiaries. So now what are the benefits of learning personal finance? Of course, and in the group, we have a basic personal finance course, personal finance, personal financial management course that will give you the basics in these areas. Then we have other advanced courses that we can add to those basics and of course, increase your wealth of knowledge in this area. So what is the benefits of understanding personal finance? Well, of course, the first benefit, it'll allow you to make your own financial decisions. And, uh, and you'll know the opportunity cost of those decisions because every decision you make has an opportunity cost. And you remember that you can make, you'll be able to make solid financial decisions for yourself and your family, as well as remember that knowledge is power and no one cares more about your own finances than you do. And of course, what you don't know can hurt you in personal finance. And so the idea here is to gain as much knowledge as you can in this field. So then when you're working and you're pursuing your careers, you have that knowledge to use for yourself and your families. Remember that advice is not free. Of course, you are charged fees. And the more you can do yourself, the more you will be able to then save. Also, you'll be able to judge the quality of investment advice. As you go through your various life stages, you will have to often engage with other financial advisors, be they lawyers, accountants, uh, and uh, other financial planners and wealth manage managers, portfolio managers. Of course, you want to make sure that they are working in your best interest. Remember that wrong advice can cost you and can all often be very hard to undo. So personal finance will allow you to keep yourself on track to meet your goals as well. Will you be able to ask the right questions about, uh, about finance? One of the studies that the FP Canada that who gives the CFP certification did is they found that many individuals, investors aren't able to ask the right questions because they don't know enough to ask their advisors and therefore they let their advisor do the decisions. But now you can take control and make your own decisions, avoid scams that are out there and ask the right questions. Of course, another benefit of understanding personal finance is that you may want to pursue a career in this area. It's a fast growing career in wealth management and financial planning. And of course, we will talk about the CFP designation is the premier designation for financial planning uh, globally. And of course, why is there growth in wealth management and financial planning and who, are, who is hiring? Well, of course, uh, we can see that it's a world of opportunity. Of course, uh, the chartered banks, trust and loan companies, credit unions, finance and lease companies, every auto, uh, uh, auto company uh, from GM to Mercedes have, have, uh, have auto and lease finance co companies, mortgage companies, mutual fund companies, accounting firms, consulting firms, entrepreneurial businesses, law offices, and, and more. And the average CFP, according to FP Canada, they have reported that they earn 65% of the CFP's earned income of greater than $100,000. Now, 
Why is this a growing field? Well, first of all, there are several trends that are, uh, that are causing the growth in the wealth management financial planning field. Well, one is the fact that the baby boomers, they're getting older. And as they're retiring, they're causing a boom in the area of financial planning and financial services. They need the advice. Another reason is that regulators and governments, they're very concerned about the financial literacy of both individual investors, as well as advisors. They want to be able to uh, make sure that advisors are not just selling products, but are providing investment advice and financial advice about estate planning, about, uh, about taxation, uh, uh, about debt management. Uh, the regulators are very concerned that, as we said, Canadians are spending far too much and accumulating debt and, for example, not saving enough. So this is causing uh, uh, the, the, the industry to move toward from a transactional area of products and services to more uh, advice consulting areas of wealth management, where the advice can, advisor can give full service advice as well as provide financial plans for small businesses and individuals and professionals. So this is also, you will find that many traditional firms like accounting firms, law firms, actuarial professions, uh, they are looking to CFP professionals to give them more information and service their clients in the wealth management financial planning area. And so uh, we see that when we look at when we look at the CFP certification, uh, now there is a direct part to the certif CFP certification. Now the CFP designation is a global designation, and in fact, it is comes out of the United States, uh, and uh, and it's and it's, it's it is it is managed by and organized by the financial stand financial planning standards board out in the U.S and they decentralized designa that designation to various countries in Europe, in Asia, in North America. And there are over 133,000 uh, professionals, CFP certified professionals uh, in the world of about 18 to 19,000 are now in, in Canada. And so, it, so when at McMaster, what we do is that we offer all the courses and uh, in, that cover all the materials and more for the CFP designation. So you can, it can provide you with the information for lucrative careers in wealth management in this fast growing area of wealth management and financial planning. And so I look forward to uh, teaching some of you in the future and as uh, students and, uh, and thank you. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sumi. Um, so next we have Marco. Um, so Marco, as I mentioned, uh, is quite involved um, as a student in many different clubs and associations, and uh, he is going to speak about some of the different opportunities available to students today. So Thanks for the Marco. introduction. Uh, so hey, everybody. My name is Marco. I'm a fourth year student. Um, so I'm not paid by faculty, so I can tell you the truth. Uh, and the truth is finance is the best uh, stream and McMaster does have the resources uh, to get you to the career uh, that you really wanna do. So as a quick overview, I'm not sure uh, if you could see, I'm a musician, came to McMaster uh, thinking that I was gonna be like the Arkells, uh, but honestly, finance was a much more interesting career. Um, and that's actually why I'm pursuing it. So I'm doing uh, investment banking post-graduation uh, and I'm part of the DeGroot Finance and Investment Council. Uh, so these are some of my colleagues who can't be here today, uh, but if you reach out to any of us on LinkedIn, uh, we're more than happy to talk to you uh, about our different career paths and what we've done in our undergrad. As a brief history, there was, you know, originally two clubs at McMaster, which really focused on finance. Uh, we thought that this wasn't really great for the student experience. We wanted to have a single hub for really ambitious students to be involved, and we created uh, DFIC. Uh, so this is now the largest finance club on campus. We have around 70 students who are actually hired members. Uh, we have around 400 general members as well. And we provide a lot of great resources, which I'll get into. Um, so as Professor Huggins kind of explained before, just about the different firms and, you know, where to be involved. 
Um, a lot of our alumni are at very great firms. Uh, so we have asset managers and pension funds such as PSP, OTPP, Fengate. We also have a lot of Canadian banks that students are involved in. So I'm a little bit biased, but National Bank is definitely one of the, uh, the best investment banks to work for after graduation. Uh, then we have some of the boutiques that were described as well, such as Raymond James um, and a bunch of other really great firms where you could work. So moving on to kind of what DFIC is and why you should be involved. So again, I wasn't involved in my first two years of McMaster, and I can honestly say that was a really big regret because clubs like DFIC provide a lot of value to your undergraduate experience. Um, so as a quick overview in the mission statement of the club, we're effectively acting as a hub for ambitious students. So if you wanna work at a great company like Tesla or RBC or any really great name brand, we're here to teach you those valuable lessons um, that we hope you find interesting and you're able to carry forth towards your career. So overall, we have introductory career sessions to really dive in deep um, about a lot of those professions that were briefly touched upon today, such as our introduction to sell side, buy side, consulting, et cetera, um, really to make sure that within your first and second year at McMaster, you know what careers are out there and you're able to choose and you know find what's best for you. Next, we have learning sessions. So building on what you'll learn in Professor Ahmed's 2FA3 and 3FA3, we really try and take that to the next level by providing you with more hands-on learning experiences where you could build uh, models that you'd actually be working on within your internship. Next up, we have our big events. So these are those kind of suit and tie networking events or competitions, um, but we honestly think that they're a great way for students to meet our alumni. It's a really good way to network, build a broad variety of connections, and also just get to be with, you know, students who are in the finance field who will soon be your coworkers. Next up, we have our investment fund. Um, so in Professor Chamberlain's security analysis course, you're going to learn a lot about, you know, stock picking and building your own portfolio. And we actually have our own fund, which does this. Um, so I've been on the fund now for two years. Um, it's a really great uh, experience. You get to build presentation decks. And these decks are very similar to what you're going to learn in the real world. When you're actually going into interviews and you're meeting with different people and networking, you can actually bring one of these decks that you created on the DFIC investment fund and show them, hey, I worked on a stock pitch for XYZ company. I built the model for this and it's gonna be really impressive overall. Next up, we have our private markets team. Um, this is an extension of the investment fund. They focus on the private equity space um, and identifying private companies who would be really good leveraged buyout targets. Um, it's a little bit of a, a complex topic, but I'm sure you guys will learn it and find it really interesting at McMaster. And then we have our mentorship program. So the mentorship program is really aimed at first and second year students to kind of get them onto the uh, learning curve, get the ball rolling and be involved with some older students who have, you know, been through different internships and, and struggled with recruiting and, you know, know what it takes to get to the next level. That's our main focus here. So all of these, uh, we have hiring coming up in August and September. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about it yet. Uh, just when you're coming into McMaster or if you're returning for next year, keep an eye out um, for us on Instagram. And then these are some of our resources, uh, which we actually have. So we have our premium membership, which gives you access to a bunch of interview guides. Um, so we actually lay it out exactly what interview questions will be asked uh, within investment banking, private equity, sales and trading. We have law guides as well and consulting. So, it, you know, it's a really good resource for students looking to be involved. Um, we also have a YouTube page. So if you were interested in learning more about Excel, I know Professor Ahmed now interests, uh, introduces that to you in second year. Um, but if you want to learn Excel before you enter that class, check out our YouTube page. We also talked about uh, leverage buyouts and I run through an example on there. Next, we have a podcast. Um, it's really beautiful outside right now. I'm sure everybody is excited to get back out. Um, so we have a podcast that you could listen to on your walks where we have a lot of really great alumni and professionals uh, come on and speak to us, which is we're really happy about. And then finally, we have one of my favorite resources, uh, which is our newsletter and tracker. 
Um, so effectively what this is, is this is a weekly kind of news update that we send out to around 400 people um, that the DFIC team makes. And effectively what it is, is it's supposed to be a quick read to update you on what's happened in the market, whether that be the equity market, debt market, uh, M&A, et cetera. So some interesting things that you may find within the tracker, I'm sure everybody here has heard of Jay-Z uh, and Tidal. Well, a company called Square recently acquired Tidal for around $297 million. This is a type of transaction that A, you would work in within investment banking, you'd probably write a little article about it in equity research. Or if you were on the buy side, you'd probably want to buy Square now as they have some momentum with this title acquisition. So that's just some you know, interesting news things that will come up. Um, you'll also learn about different companies and their strategies and what they're doing. For example, Yum Brands um, recently acquired a company where they're actually diving into AI to further analyze consumer behavior. So within finance, there's a lot of different nuances um, and really interesting things that happen within this career that unless you're involved, you may just think finance is, you know, a pretty boring field. That's an old field that, you know, may be taken out by AI. Um, I can assure you that it's not. It's highly exciting. And I can honestly recommend it uh, as one of the best fields to enter uh, as you come into McMaster and when you graduate. Uh, so now I'll pass it on to Professor Chamberlain. Well, good morning, everyone. I um, I'm just um, uh, uh, I'm just bringing up uh, my slides here. Um, having said that, I'm not going to go through all of my slides. Um, we just received a, a warning from um, the timekeeper that um, our time is almost up because we do want to allow uh, uh, ten minutes for a question and answer sessions. So uh, let me just tell you that the slide package that um, I have prepared, um, I think perhaps the, sli or the slides are going to be posted. But beyond that, um, the slides are available in a slightly different form on the um, Honors uh, Bachelor of Commerce website. Um, so you can go through them and get all of the information that I have included here. Um, now, let, let me just briefly tell you that um, what I do in this little uh, package that I prepare each year is uh, take students through the uh, various uh, streams in the uh, financial industry in which students may choose to work and uh, suggest courses that they might want to take. Um, I also talk specifically about uh, designations in the financial sector, uh, which uh, doctors uh, Chung and Professor uh, Bose have, have already discussed, specifically the CFA and the CFP. Uh, I might also mention that um, uh, we have a, uh, we're a partner with the uh, Global Association of Risk Professionals uh, in our Master of Finance program and I might just mention to you that uh, for those of you who do want to go beyond a Bachelor of Commerce a degree at McMaster, uh, there are a number of other postgraduate options. Um, we have, of course, the uh, MBA program, which has a finance, well, it has two specializations that are finance related. We have a finance specialization and valuation specialization for those students who want to go on to become what are known as a chartered business valuators. In other words, as uh, professionals who val uh, value uh, private companies and, and things of that nature. Um, in addition, at the master's level, we have the Masters of Finance program, which is quite a high level program. Uh, um, 
it, um, <coughs> students with the type of training they need, in particular, if they want to become uh, risk professionals uh, in the financial sector. And, and risk, risk management is a huge part of uh, finance nowadays. Um, uh, our program is just overwhelmed with uh, applications. Um, we get excellent students in that program. It's uh, something that uh, you might want to look at at a future date. And for those of you who uh, perhaps are contemplating uh, a career in academia, and I know it's, it's early days yet, but um, uh, perhaps one of or two of you will eventually decide that you want to go on and do a PhD in finance. We uh, we do offer a PhD uh, field within the PhD in um, uh, um, uh, business administration program at McMaster. Um, if I may, uh, listening to the other speakers, um, uh, rather than go through my slides, perhaps I can just comment on one or two things. Uh, Dr. Chung, for example, talked about uh, how finance is about money. And um, uh, let me, if I may just share a little story with you, which uh, uh, highlights the point. And um, this uh, story goes back to uh, when my older daughter, who by the way is now 39 years old and has children of her own, uh, was a, a kindergarten student. And the teacher asked their asked the students what their uh, parents did uh, in their in their uh, professions. And um, uh, my daughter said, well, uh, my daddy's a finance professor. And the teacher said, well, Robin, what is finance? And Robin replied, well, finance is about money. And when you have money, you feel fine. And when you feel fine, you want to dance. So it's really fine dance, but they call it finance for short. So um, there you go. Um, come into our field and in the future, you'll be able to do lots of dancing. Uh, now, uh, one other um, thing that I thought I would mention listening to the uh, previous presentations, uh, uh, Professor Huggins talked about how um, the financial sector is a very large part of the Canadian economy. There are more than a million uh, people working in that sector. Uh, I, my, if I have my uh, data correct, uh, the financial sector uh, is responsible for about 20% of the Canadian gross national product. So it's very, very important. Uh, but I should add to that that many students who go through and study finance do so not with a view to a job in the financial sector, working for a bank, an insurance company, uh, or an investment firm, or a, a pension plan, or investment advisory, or something of that nature. They're interested in careers in corporate finance, or they're interested in careers in uh, starting their own businesses or in small businesses. And uh, we offer courses, as if you look at the uh, little document that I've prepared. We have, a, we cover courses that cover, our offer courses that cover all of those things. So we, we, we try our best to be a full service department in terms of uh, offering students opportunities for every aspect of finance. Um, um, uh, Marco mentioned a moment ago how AE is being introduced uh, into the financial sector, AI is being introduced into the financial sector. Well, you know, we're trying to stay ahead of the curve on this and this year, and it's included in my at the end of my package as well, uh, we're offering within the uh, special topics in finance uh, um, course, we're offering a course on big data in finance. Uh, we already have a course on fintech. So we're, we're, we try very hard to stay up with uh, evolving trends in the field and with evolving technology. Um, I noticed finally, and, and I do want to leave a moment, a few minutes for questions, but I noticed finally uh, there were a couple of questions uh, 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 posted about uh, 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 um, for example, one student uh, asked about a career in corporate finance or uh, corporate law. What should they study? Well, corporate law 
may be specifically about corporations. It may also be about securities regulation. I mean, we offer numerous courses on the corporate finance side uh, beyond the required Commerce 2FB3. Uh, we offer intermediate uh, corporate finance. We offer applied corporate finance. And on the, on the um, security side or the um, financial industry side, we offer securities analysis, alternative investments in finance, financial institutions. Um, uh, if we don't offer it, you don't want it. Um, I think I can fairly say. Uh, so I'll stop now. Uh, I uh, I finally, I'd just like to say before uh, closing that I want to acknowledge and thank uh, my colleagues and the uh, staff in the Student Experience Office who organized this session this morning. I think it's it's a great way of providing students. And I can remember when I was uh, your age, not knowing what I wanted to do with my life and there not being any resources available. Uh, but I think this is a good way of uh, bringing options, whether they're in finance or some other field, uh, to the attention of students. So thank you all. And uh, I hope uh, the rest of the term goes well. All right, thank you, Dr. Chamberlain. And I'll thank all of our panelists as well. Um, and uh, Trevor's kicked off our um, question and answer. So that's the an answer to the question about corporate law. Um, and I'll just highlight that there is a corporate law course offered in the group, the 4SD3. Um, that's offered this summer even, so keep your eyes open for that. <clears throat> um, so I know there are some other questions. Um, I did see one about when do students declare. Um, so it's really beginning. Um, so for in-course students now, uh, you do begin your commerce elective starting in year two. Um, so you'll have an open elective next year, depending on if you're going to level two. Um, so there's no formal declaration process. So as I mentioned, uh, students don't, um, don't graduate with a Bachelor of Finance at the end of this. It's really up to you to manage your electives and to be able to tell your story when you are meeting with recruiters and different um, sort of future job prospects to share how you structured your degree using these courses. Um, so there's nothing that you have to declare formally and there isn't a, a maximum number that can progress into these finance electives. So if, if you are interested, um, it's just go and enroll in those courses. And then I would use our session today as a guide for which of those courses are going to be most relevant for you. Greg, if I could just add to that, the uh, among the finance electives, uh, there is only one that has a, a prerequisite beyond the two required courses. So students, when they're choosing electives, um, uh, all of the finance electives in both uh, 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 levels three and four are available to uh, all students in levels three and four. Um, the, and the, it's probably fair to say that in general, uh, the level four courses uh, tend to be a little more specialized than the level three courses. And so there's a certain logic to taking uh, level three courses in third year and level four courses in fourth year, but it's not necessary to follow that sequence. The only course that has a prerequisite beyond uh, Commerce 2F B3, uh, the old uh, Commerce 3F A3 uh, for uh, some of you, um, is uh, Commerce 4F M3, the financial planning course, which requires that students take uh, Commerce 4F L3, the uh, introductory level personal financial management course first. But other than that, uh, we've structured the courses so that students don't have to take a series of prerequisites in order to access uh, uh, certain courses. I can't hear you, Greg. Yeah, so just checking the other questions. Um, was there any others that came up over? I know there was one about valuations. Alexis, are you able to share? Sorry, what is the question?
what what is the question, Greg? Yeah, no, I'm looking to try to find it. Oh, um, it, came, it came in during the presentation. Um. Um, so there is a question just about the, that I did find just how uh, we're sharing the recordings. Um, so please stay tuned for that. We, we will post them um, on our website, or links to them rather. So you'll be able to access them from there. Um, so we'll share the details on where we're um, hosting these after all the sessions are complete. Um, and if there's no other questions, again, if there are other questions, um, if you can send them to us, it is something that we can use Discord. And so I just wanted to highlight that Within Discord, we have shared some information, some interesting case studies, um, as well as links to the finance area and all of the research and faculty that are contained within. Um, so I'll, I'll refer you to Discord as well. Um, and, and we can share information about the, the video posting there as well. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, again, there's, there's a lot of uh, work and a lot of attention required for this. So I'll thank everyone involved and all of our attendees as well. Um, so enjoy the rest of your day. and. We may see you tomorrow. Um, so tomorrow is, is it marketing? No, Friday's HR. I'm trying to remember who tomorrow is. Tomorrow's accounting. So we have accounting tomorrow, uh, same time. So thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye, all. Have, have a great day.